I'm Matt McClure, and this is Currents. Currents takes a look back at the top stories of 2011. First up, protests in Egypt lead to the overthrow of a dictator and uncertainty for Christians. From that moment, there is some anxiety in the heart of the Christians. Sure. Plus, May 1st was a big day for the Catholic Church. Pope John Paul II came one step closer to sainthood. He was a very positive person, one of the greatest Polish people in our history, actually. And what was the top religious story of 2011? Here's a hint, it also happened on May 1st. Good evening and thanks for joining us for a special edition of Currents. Tonight we're going to take a look back at some of the top stories of 2011, particularly those that had a profound impact on the church around the globe. And we'll end tonight's show with the story that was voted the number one religion story of the year by the Religion News Writers Association, so stay tuned to find out what it is. But first, it was one of the biggest developments in the so-called Arab Spring the uprisings in Egypt that led to the end of Hosni Mubarak's 30-year reign. Egyptians took to the streets and to social media to demand change in their country. And as CNN's Elizabeth Corridan reports, they got what they asked for. Inspired by a successful revolution in Tunisia that removed that country's president, a revolt began in Cairo on January 25th. Thousands of Egyptians took to the streets for what was called a day of rage, demanding the end of Hosni Mubarak's nearly 30 years in power. Relying heavily on social media sites like Facebook, Twitter and YouTube to organize, protests spread quickly across Egypt. And it wasn't long before things turned violent as government forces faced off against the anti-government protesters. Reacting to the increasingly angry crowds, on January 29th, Mubarak acknowledged the protesters' concerns and calls for reform. He also announced he'd sacked his cabinet. I asked the government to resign today. But Mubarak did not step down. Days later, he announced he was not going to run for re-election, but that he would finish out his term. Each announcement was met with growing anger from protesters who refused to budge. Everybody will be here. We have also two choices. The first choice, Mubarak leave, and the second choice, we die here. The military-imposed curfew was consistently ignored. Key voices of opposition were heard, including former Google executive Wael Gunim, who was freed after being held by Egyptian authorities for about 10 days, and Nobel laureate and former head of the UN's nuclear watchdog, Mohammed El Baradeh, he returned to Cairo to speak out. I am here hopefully to work with, with everybody to ensure that we go through an orderly, peaceful process of change. On February 11th, after tens of thousands of angry protesters filled the streets yet again, Egypt's vice president announced Mubarak had resigned as president and was handing over power to the army. President Hosni Mubarak has decided to give up and commission the Supreme Council, higher council of armed forces, to take over. Upon hearing the news, Tahrir Square erupted in celebration. We're here to celebrate because we never believed that we could come this far. We're very proud of our country and we wanted the world to see this. With Mubarak out, things seemed to settle down in Egypt until November. Tens of thousands jammed Tahrir Square to protest against military rulers, only a week before the first parliamentary elections. The elections went forward, and on November 28th, millions of Egyptians turned out at dawn to cast their ballots. Today, the new parliament continues to form, and the future of the revolution is anything but clear. CNN's Elizabeth Corrid in there, and the situation is even less clear for Egypt's Coptic Christians, who make up about 10% of the population. In July, I had a chance to sit down with the patriarch of the Coptic Catholic Church, Cardinal Antonius Naguib, to find out how Christians were coping with the change. And here's some of what he had to say. In the beginning, we're very happy with the, the atmosphere that were reigning in the El Tahrir Liberation Square in Cairo. For a week later, the situation was 
so magnificent and the relation Christian Muslim nobody was looking at that and uh, we had a great hope that it will last but after that appeared some forces of radical Islamists who claimed for a religious state and legislation and it was in opposition to all the principle and uh, all the hopes and all the vision of uh, the starting and uh, the uh, aims of this revolution. And from that moment, there is some anxiety. Anxiety indeed, and of course, we'll continue to follow all of the developments in that story and the situation for Coptic Christians in Egypt. We'll stay with us. There's more currents coming up. There was some good news for the Catholic Church in 2011 as a beloved pope came one step closer to becoming a saint. We'll show you how the faithful celebrated in Rome and right here in Brooklyn next. Welcome back to this special edition of Currents, the top stories of 2011. I'm Matt McClure. Well, when you think of big stories in the Catholic Church over the past year, you might think of World Youth Day in Madrid. Young people from all across the globe gathered in Spain for a huge celebration of their faith. Or maybe you think of the changes to the English translation of the Mass. It was the first update to the Catholic liturgy in the U.S. in nearly 40 years. And those were certainly big developments, but for many people, the biggest story of the year was Pope Benedict declaring his predecessor to be one step closer to sainthood. On May 1st, thousands gathered in Rome for this historic moment that saw Pope John Paul II become Blessed John Paul II. You know, but the faithful also gathered right here in Brooklyn for a mass of celebration. It happened at the largely Polish Paris of, parish of St. Francis de Chantal. My sisters and brothers, we gather here this afternoon with great joy. We join our hearts and our minds with the millions of our sisters and brothers who gathered with Pope Benedict to celebrate this wonderful occasion of the beatification of Pope John Paul II. We also join our minds and our hearts with our sisters and brothers in Poland, for this is a great day of rejoicing. Beatification is the official recognition on the part of the church that a person who has gone before us in faith is truly a person of holiness, who can be venerated, who can be really admired, and whose example can be followed. A gorgeous uh, day, beautiful uh, mass, and uh, many people come here. We are happy because Jean Paul was our father. I was the, the teenager when he was when he was on his pontificate. So he was very actually powerful. That was a very powerful person who who speaks and who know how to get to the young people. And this, because of him, you know, many people probably get back to the church, get back to their faith. He was a very positive person, one of the greatest Polish people in our history, actually. To be able to empathize with people who are, who are suffering, who lived in injustice, uh, and to be able to be an effective advocate for them, uh, marked his papacy. He would like every people to be brothers and sisters. For him, every people uh, was in the same level. Nobody was higher, nobody lower. He was like a man who brings the love. That's the most important. It's a great honor for Poland. We're very proud of him. They came from all over. Brooklyn came here to pray because they needed some pray in his Polish language, Polish spirit. Anyone who's of Polish descent, today is a day of tremendous spiritual pride and joy. I try to actually follow him, you know, in, in many, many things. I try to be uh, very tolerant to everything because he was, the, he was the person who joined different religious. So I try to follow him, you know, I try to just 
be close to him. A faithful son of Poland lived through all of the uh, oppression and persecution that the Poles lived through under Nazism, under communism. Um, they remained faithful, he remained faithful with such courage, such dignity, such effectiveness, and now to be numbered among the blessed? Beati nomine in postum appellitur, in nomine Patris et Fili et Spiritus Sancti. A very big day for the Catholic Church back in May. Well, there's more currents on the way. We'll see what Brooklyn's bishop has to say about the top stories of the year next. Welcome back. Tonight we are counting down the top stories of 2011, especially those stories that had a big impact on the Catholic Church. Now coming up at the end of the show, we'll share the top religion story of the year as voted on by religion news writers, so don't go anywhere, okay? But first, it's our pleasure to have Brooklyn Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio here with us in the studio every week. And with this particular episode of the show focusing on the big stories of the year, we thought we'd ask the bishop what he thinks were some of the most newsworthy developments from the last 12 months. News director Ed Wilkinson sat down with the bishop for this week's Into the Deep. Bishop DiMarzio, thanks for being with us again today. Good to be with you. Uh, here we are, uh, almost at the start of a new year, 2012, and the uh, time goes <laughs> rather quickly, doesn't rather it? Quickly. <laughs> it's been a uh, pretty exciting he year here in the Diocese of Brooklyn. Uh, as you look back, uh, what are some of the highlights? I mean, certainly one of the things is the uh, debate that took place over the same-sex marriage uh, right. uh, up in Albany. A very that was a short debate. There was it was a debate. short debate. There was no big debate on it. it was a political, that's part of the problem, right? Political move. That was the problem, that mm -hmm. it was done in within a week. And uh, there was no chance to debate it. There were no hearings on it. The process, I think, was a really a failed political process, a successful one for those who wanted it. And for those who might be opposed, there was no process. It just was a, a uh, kind of a, um, a sneak attack, maybe, we might say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it was a the disappointing thing uh, because, again, I think the, the, the institution of marriage has been weakened uh, by... Uh, claiming that same-sex marriages are marriage or not marriage or whatever you want to call them but they're not marriage mm -hmm. and I think that was ba basically our point we're not uh, against anyone but at the same time we're trying to defend the institution of marriage mm -hmm. which is in uh, tough s s straits today it's not sure. an easy uh, situation there's so many separations divorces mm -hmm. we want to do all we can to strengthen it and when we have uh, a dissolution issue basically that anything can be called a marriage practically uh, you're not really strengthening marriage. Yeah. Did that issue kind of sneak up on us in the... Uh it was. It was something that we thought wasn't going to be uh, ha handled by the end of the session, and all of a sudden, within the last week of the session, it was in the very 11th hour right. before the session closed. It was voted on in a very close session uh, situation where there wasn't any op opportunity. Our, our, obviously, we would have liked to seen a referendum on this because that could have happened. Uh, they chose not to. Uh, I think the will of the people would have been clearly shown at that time in any state <coughs> where it was put the referendum and never passed. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really the will of the people, it's not just the will of a few. Yeah. As uh, we're coming into 2012, it's a, it's a presidential election year, and uh, I know the, uh, the bishops are always concerned about it. Uh, and they, uh, they reissued faithful citizenship right. uh, this year. Uh, how do you hope that that document impacts the uh, the voters this year? Well, faithful citizenship really is a, a guide to conscience formation. Mm -hmm. It's not a guide to a voter guide, but it tells us what should we consider when we vote? What are the key issues for us as Catholics? And then we should form our conscience and make those decisions. They're never easy decisions. There's no candidate, there's no party that's going to completely satisfy uh, what we believe or what we hold as Catholic social teaching. But we have to do our best. Those are the decision points when we've got to sometimes compromise uh, w what we think is the best and then try to find the best. You know, you, you always mm -hmm. look for, the, for the, uh, the best candidate that can fulfill what we believe to be uh, the path uh, for the common good in our country and for mm -hmm. uh, the moral issues that we hold uh, important. 
So this is going to be a tough, tough year uh, as the mm -hmm. debates are happening and as uh, the candidates then will finally debate, I think we'll be able to make a better decision to know sure. exactly where they stand. And to be clear, the church never endorses a particular candidate. No. It, it speaks to the issues. It speaks to the issues and then you have to make your decision on the basis of how the candidates uh, deal with the issues. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're clever, they kind of skirt them, they never really come <laughs> out with a position. But we do uh, publish in, in our tablet uh, where people will respond to mm -hmm. how they stand on particular issues. So we try to sure. get people to p be pinned down, and uh, it's never easy to do that. You know, politicians always tell people what they want to hear, but the religious people should be telling people what they should hear, not what they want to hear. Yeah. And that's the, that's the difference. And 2012 uh, continued to be a year of change here in the diocese itself. Christ Jesus, our hope moves on, seems to, be, right. uh, seems to be working. Are you pleased with the progress that that program is Yes, made? and we hope maybe by the end of uh, 2012 we'll have really completed uh, Christ Jesus Our Hope, and that gives us a year. We think the next two stages that are, that are on the uh, offing, that they will be able to have every parish reviewed, have them with a strategic plan, and if there are need for consolidations, we'll know at least what direction. They may not all happen in 2012, but we have to see the parishes that have plans, how they're, how they're actualizing them, and we'll see in the next year what we need to do. Yeah, and people always get nervous, of course, they think their church is going to close. Yeah, it, yeah. That this, this program is not about closing churches. We no. should make that point It's again. about strengthening our churches and letting people evaluate themselves and see if they can support a parish or do they need to be combined with another parish to be able to support uh, what's, barely, what's really necessary uh, for parish life. So. Uh, and there's a lot of consultation. That's why it's taking a long time. We're not just doing this uh, with some kind of drawing board in the chancery office. We are talking to people, and mm -hmm. people have a chance to respond. So it's a very collaborative process. Mm -hmm. Well, Bishop, I want to wish you the best of luck okay, in the coming year, you. and uh, it's good to work with you. Happy New Year. Thank you. And uh, all the best in 2012. All right, very good. Good to be with you. A look back and a look ahead with Bishop DeMarzio. Always great to have him here. Well, there's more currents coming up. 2011 marked a solemn anniversary, but there was also reason for many Americans to take to the streets in celebration. We'll reveal our number one top story of the year next. Finally tonight, 2011 marked a very solemn anniversary for New York and the country as a whole. Ten years since the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Florence Moran Gregory. At Ground Zero in Lower Manhattan, family members read the names of those killed that day in the Twin Towers, as has become custom. The world also got its first look at the new 9-11 Memorial, which contains two large reflecting pools in the footprints of the original towers, along with names of the nearly 3,000 people who died in New York, Washington, and Pennsylvania, along with the victims of the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. Earlier in the year, though, the man responsible for organizing the worst terrorist attacks on American soil, Osama bin Laden, was brought to justice at the hands of U.S. Special Forces. CNN's Karen Kaifa has more. In the early morning hours of May 2nd, 2011, a nearly decade-long search for the world's most wanted terrorist came to an end. The United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda, and a terrorist who's responsible for the murder of thousands of innocent men, women, and children. It was a raid years in the making. The CIA identified a trusted bin Laden courier in 2007. It wasn't until late 2010 when U.S. authorities finally honed in on the highly fortified compound where the courier lived in Abdabad, Pakistan. The city is about a two-hour drive from the country's capital. President Obama ordered the operation on May 1st without concrete evidence that bin Laden would actually be in the compound. Uh, the president had to evaluate uh, the strength of the information and then made what I believe was one of the, the most uh, gutsiest calls uh, of uh, any president in recent memory. Eight 
team of U.S. Navy SEALs flew in from a base in Afghanistan. They killed five people in the compound, including bin Laden. The terrorist leader was unarmed, but the SEALs had authority to kill him when he didn't surrender. The White House monitored the raid in real time. This photo capturing a tense moment became the iconic image of the operation. Just 38 minutes after landing in Abdabad, the SEALs left, carrying bin Laden's body along with computers, videos and documents, the single largest collection of terrorist materials ever seized. DNA tests were conducted on the body to confirm bin Laden's identity before he was buried at sea. But for many around the world, the DNA was not enough. They wanted to see a picture of bin Laden's corpse. The White House ultimately decided not to release any photos. It is important for us to make sure that very graphic photos of somebody who was shot in the head are not floating around as an incitement to additional violence or as a propaganda tool. That's not who we are. Word of bin Laden's demise caused spontaneous celebrations outside the White House and in New York. But for many Americans, the news was bittersweet. And on nights like this one, we can say to those families who have lost loved ones to al-Qaeda's terror, justice has been done. Days later, President Obama laid a wreath at Ground Zero and visited a firehouse in New York that lost 15 men on 9-11. CNN's Karen Kaifa there, but one of those spontaneous celebrations that broke out in the streets well, that brings us to our top religion news story of the year, as voted on by the Religion News Writers Association. Journalists voted the faith response to bin Laden's death as the year's top story. So what is the appropriate response from a Catholic perspective? Well, the day after troops killed the world's most wanted terrorists, I had a chance to ask that very question of Father Joe Gibino, professor of systematic theology at St. John's University. Father Gibino, thanks so much for joining us here. We appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. Well, uh, first of all, just want to get your thoughts about these celebrations that uh, that broke out kind of spontaneously last night, both in New York and in Washington. Well, I think we have uh, we're walking a very fine line with these celebrations, uh, and because, as you said, they were spontaneous, they always involve human emotion, and emotions can never, in these situations, be allowed to get the better of us. I think what every Catholic needs to do is keep in mind the whole notion of the common good. We are, by nature, a people who live in society. So we always have to ask ourselves, what will the societal repercussion be? Is this really good for society in general? Now, as the Vatican noted, it, we have to be a little cautious, because is this going to add more fuel to an already burning fire? Mayor Giuliani earlier today suggested that we should not be too anticipatory in our celebrations because they could lead to more difficulties. So in terms of just our common good, I think we need to be a people now who are reflective, who um, kind of rein in the emotion a bit and use logic to help analyze where we go from here. Sure. Well, of course, I last night, as, as, this, uh, as these announcements were made, I, I sort of had that that the sort of tugging of the of the different emotions as well wanting to be sort of happy but then also saying wait this is kind of weirding me out that i feel that i need to be happy over the death of a, of a human being so there have been feelings of you know revenge i guess uh, that, that we've you know taken out our revenge on on bin laden but there's a difference between revenge and justice being served if you could talk about that and explain that to to our viewers from a catholic perspective and that's a, a very important point in this discussion, because vengeance in and of itself is not justice. And I think every person needs to step back and put the emotion aside for a moment and say, do I want justice or do I want vengeance? Because justice is one of the four cardinal virtues. And those virtues are all come together to inform this situation. And when the first virtue is prudence, and that's the virtue that disposes our human reason to discern what is a true good in every situation. So our first question is, is this good? And prudence gives us that insight. Justice flows from prudence, and justice desires a firm and constant desire to do the will of God towards our neighbor. So it's a virtue of religion to stop and say, is this God's will? And justice disposes us also to respect the rights 
of every human being and to establish in our human common good relationships that promote equality and justice and respect for all persons. Mm. And then fortitude kicks in, because that virtue allows us to ensure our own stability or our own rightness of heart in difficult times, so that we're always aiming to do the good. Father Joe Gibino uh, with St. John's University, really appreciate your time. And of course, we'll keep you on our speed dial as we always do when these, uh, when these issues come up. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Take care, Matt. Thanks, bye-bye. There you go, the number one religion news story of the year, the faith response to Osama bin Laden's death. Well, that is it for this special look back edition of Currents as we look back at the top stories of 2011. Now, until next time, check us out on our website. It is CurrentsNY.net. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Matt McClure. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great night.